You are listening to the Two and Out CFL Podcast, a proud member of the Canadian Football Podcast Network. It's Travis Curra and Sheldon Jones as we get you ready for week 11 of the 2024 CFL season. Uh, Sheldon, Tuesday was a massive day in the Canadian Football League where we learned that Nathan Rourke would be returning to the BC Lions. And also, uh, we're going to find out who is going to be the owner of the Edmonton Elks this week. It does appear the former, I guess, owner of Thompson Brothers Construction in Edmonton, Larry Thompson, will be the owner of the Elks. I did a bit of an emergency recap of the day's news for YouTube and our podcast listeners. Um, But your immediate thoughts on both of the stories we'll start with uh, Nathan Rourke what stands out to you the most as the dust starts to settle a little bit uh well first off it was quick so I think they obviously must have had some sort of contract kind of sitting in the in the desk drawer there so like honestly it's good with with BC's quarterback situation right now with VA hurt uh it's good to get him here as quick as possible and with having the same coaches and the same system and most of the same players, like hopefully for BC, it's like riding a bike and he just gets right back on the horse. And according to Farhan today, it looked like he had a good day of practice. He only had one incompletion that he could see. And it was from a, from a defensive breakdown. So, uh, you know, we he didn't perform great in that preseason game, but at the same time, apparently he didn't even have any reps at practice. So, uh, that's a little bit different than him playing in a system where he, you know, was the best player in the league basically for 10 games a few years ago. So I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I hope, I hope BC knows what they're doing. Uh, They're spending a lot of money. They're going all in on the great cup and that's great to be honest. Uh, We'll see how long it takes VA to get back healthy with them cutting Dola Gala also today. I think that that must mean he's he's closer than he than we think maybe but uh all in all great for the league it's great to have hopefully this guy can be that face of the of the league that we thought we might have with another player and I think it, it, it'd be great to have a Canadian quarterback be the fate like we haven't had this since uh, you know, in the seventies, right? So it's we could have two possibly great Canadian quarterback starters, and and who knows what the future has with with his brother Curtis being draft eligible this year. Uh, there's another quarterback that was in an NFL camp who's from Can- from Canada. So you know, maybe we see the rise of the Canadian quarterback in the CFL. And the Lions have said, hey, uh, you know, if he does want to give the NFL a shot in the off season, that's fine. Good for him. Go chase those dreams and go chase that uh, money. Of course, careers are short. They're not going to hold them back from that. But when we talk about money and you talk about the face of the league, that's the big conversation that's come out of this is the the marketing uh, money side of this thing. Now, uh, teams are allowed to, well, no, they're supposed to spend $100,000. Uh, Mm -hmm. On their roster, a a minimum, I guess this money is audited, we're learning, and uh, teams are supposed to prove to the league that these players are doing the marketing work, they're out there, they are the face of the franchise. Now, Nathan Work's contract is going to include $200,000 of this marketing money that won't count towards the salary cap. Since then, we've learned that Brady Oliveira has about 30K of it in Winnipeg. Chad Kelly in Toronto has a six-figure figure figure, uh, when it comes to this marketing money as well. But it does seem like an oversight in the CBA, Sheldon, that there is a minimum for spending, but it doesn't seem a maximum. So that is in BC's favor. Uh, The fact that Amar Doman is willing to spend this money, willing to invest it into Nathan Rourke and the franchise and the marketing, not all teams kind of have that luxury at this point. Yeah, and and you see with with this new owner coming into Edmonton who uh, sold his his company for... (laughs) I think it was tens of billions of dollars or something crazy. I don't know if it was 10, but it was, it was definitely billions. And, uh, 
he could have the potential to want to spend as much as he wants to. You know, if PKP in Montreal could do that, you have caretaker Bob in Hamilton. The thing I kind of wonder is what about these community teams who don't have unlimited funds in their coffers? Could they, are they able to compete with this? Uh, and, and at the other side of this, like if you're paying Nathan Rourke $200 to be marketing in the community, that's great. Hopefully you can get as much exposure with him as possible, but when you're auditing it, how do you figure out how much a certain person is worth per hour to to put in to see like like let let's say if 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 Chad Kelly's getting paid a hundred thousand dollars or more in marketing this year, that's we're not getting a good return on investment in that this year, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, maybe that when it comes time to the auditing, the Argos won't be able to say that they've been able to have him because he hasn't been out doing anything as of right now. Um, I know he was retweeting that he's a good person because he was doing some Christmas stuff. Uh, he, he retweeted that the other day. So maybe he's trying to to show that his trying to improve his image, which would be a lot better than tweeting stupid stuff. Uh, but you know what? It, this is something that I think is going to get uh, used improperly. And I think they're going to have to figure out a way to put a cap on it, which it seems kind of silly that you can have a, a cap on player salaries. You can have a cap on the amount of coaches and you can have the cap on the amount of money that you pay your coaches, but you do not have a cap on the amount of money you can spend marketing, which, you know, in a perfect world is great. We want these teams to spend money marketing, but when it comes at circumventing the cap, that's where it's a definitely a problem in my eyes and could be a big problem. Legal circumventing the cap. Yeah. Kind of like legal tampering period in, <laughs> in free agency, the, you know, the 10 days leading up to it. Now, the the, the coach's cap, the, the, the front office cap was put into place because the riders were abusing it. But that was a different time. Now the riders lost a million bucks last year. Maybe they don't have the means currently uh, to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think Olette probably gets uh, a few. He's uh, he was a big part of their marketing in the off season, but obviously he's not getting close to. He's not getting two hundred k in that marketing thing. So it's going to be fascinating to see. Here's what I also see, um, much like the Bombers were and the Riders previously, uh, both uh, teams that kind of struggled then started winning. And when they were struggling, I think some fan bases were like, they're there. And then if something exciting happened, yeah, finally, you get something to cheer for. I think people are like that currently with the BC Lions. And I think we'll see. Like Now the Bombers have become the villains. There's always got to be a heel. Uh, I see the Lions becoming the heels going forward if Rourke, you know, wins a few great cups and uh, everybody's going to be like, well, I liked what this Amar Doman did for the league, but now I don't like what he does for his team to hold mine back. And I, I see a shift coming in the near future. Yeah, but, you know, if Amar Doman has 40,000 people coming to BC Place, he'll play that villain card every day of the I week love and it. twice on Sunday. <laughs> so, uh, like, you know, and and honestly, after the next babyface turn in the CFL is for the Elks, <laughs> obviously, because I think a lot, of, a lot of us are looking at the Elks and being like, come on, we want you to win. We want Trey Ford to do well. Uh, and let's hope that stays this way because of... I guess we'll segue into the Elks talk now uh, with what is going to be announced tomorrow and uh, what possibly could be happening in the next year or two. Now, I want to be fair to Larry Thompson because this is all hearsay. This is all... Yeah, it's all rumors. Yeah. Yeah. So... I don't want to pass judgment on the guy before anything's officially uh, been said. And I, I know there's been rumblings that some think that uh, reverting back to the old name or even calling them the Esks uh, could be just putting it out there to kind of gauge, you know, <laughs> the public interest or Edmonton's interest in uh, supporting this name i don't think anybody's really smart enough to do that to just leak something and uh, see what the public is going to think about it before doing it now i will say that 
it's really unfortunate. I because you know in Edmonton a lot of instability, some financial pressures that probably aren't really being talked about to the extent that they should be. And of course, <laughs> they don't want to put out the you know the the desperate pleas for money out there. I, I understand that, but it, things are tight in Edmonton right now to make CFL football still happen in the city. So this should be an exciting time. Deep pockets, stable ownership, uh, a, a path forward. And we should t- be talking about the ways that games experience will be improved for fans and season ticket holders and everything like that. But instead, reverting back to this old conversation that we've been fighting about for five years. Um, It's really unfortunate. It just seems like, and again, I want to be fair to the new owner in Edmonton, it just feels like the circus is just going to continue. Yeah, Uh, I I completely agree. Uh, Because when I first heard that like the rumors of who it was going to be. And then I, like I heard the name and I was like, okay, I'm going to start doing some Googling. And so I did some Googling and found out about his construction company and, and, and that it's so just recently sold. And so that kind of, that kind of confirmed what a, a, a friend of ours had told us uh, off the record about what he thought was going to be happening. Uh, and then I I just got super excited because I was like, man, this is exactly what the Elks need. This guy has super deep pockets. He's a season ticket holder fan or a long time season ticket holder, local guy, like, like that's best case scenario when you can think about an ownership takeover. And then it just immediately like, just like <laughs> dissipated because I saw the, the tweets coming out about, Oh, and, and the comments and, Oh, he's just going to change the name back. And it's like, why, why can't we have nice things? Why can't we just be excited about this ownership? And, and I'm sure because it got leaked and, or, or like you said, and it's, it's, it's very likely that they did leak it out just to gauge public opinion, because that's a smart way to do things. I'm sure that somebody is going to ask the question at the press conference tomorrow. And so whatever he, however he answers is going to be very telling. Is he going to deflect? Is he going to say, no, we're, we're, we may rebrand in the future, but we're not going to, we're not going in the, in the past. We're going in the future. Or is he going to say anything? I'm willing to do anything it takes to fix this. Thinking that a name change would fix anything. Uh, so I'm very interested to see what how this this introductory or introductory uh, con- news conference goes and how what he says and and hopefully it's 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 all the right things because I've had a couple Elks fans reach out to me and just explain that they're scared and they're frustrated and they just they've seen some things some positive things happen and they don't want to go back to negative times and and like the problem of losing fans was well before the name change uh, on Twitter. Jock Cartier, he's a great follow. He put out some, he made a graph and it just showed that the steady decline ever since 2004, there's like a steady decline of every three or four years, it's three or 4,000 people leaving. So, it, and this was before a name change. This was before, this is just before they started losing every game at home. So it, <laughs> It's not a name change that took all these fans away. Yes, some fans went away because of a name change. I get that. And there will be fans that go away if they go back to this name change because they're, they'd are they be upset about that. So are you willing to lose current fans to gain back old fans? Or are you just wanting to take your current fans, try to build, bring back your old fans, but build and grow and just be positive? So I don't know. I... I I'm hoping, I'm crossing my fingers that it's all going to work out and he's going to say the right things and everything's going to be positive. And, but there is that like, kind of dark cloud that's there of just, is this going to happen? I don't want to continue having this conversation, but let's just get it out there. Let's do it. I think the CFL is one of the most regional leagues in the world. Yeah, I, I think for the most part, you cheer for the team 
where you were from or the or the team closest to you. Maybe fans in Canada identify to a uh, NFL franchise because of the name, the logo, or they just want to jump on a bandwagon with Tom Brady or Tyreek Hill or Patrick Mahomes or whoever the, the flavor of the month is in the NFL. But as far as the CFL goes, players are around for such a short time that you just cheer for the team in your city. And look at Ryder fans. It's because... It's in their identity, the province of where they come from, that they wear this stuff at the Olympics, the World Series, wherever. As much as other fans in the league are annoyed about it, well, you can do the same thing. Like just WrestleMania. <laughs> yeah, go to the World Series and <laughs> wear your Stampeders jersey. Who cares? Good for you. I think yeah. that's awesome. I don't think little Bobby in Edmonton in 1978 says... I want to go to the Edmonton Eskimos game because that's the name. I They probably want to go because it's a nice day out at a big stadium with thousands of people, an exciting game, and an exciting experience. I don't think they care what it's called. And 95% of Canada forget that there are people that live in the north. So don't tell me that you think it's because you're honoring them. That That's a joke for you to say that. Like, I'm not even going to pretend that I think about the issues up north all the time. Don't tell me as soon as a damn football team changes the name that, oh, we're honoring them. Here's yeah. the thing. The league, I mean, the team knew it was an issue. <laughs> they had this problematic imagery on their programs in the 60s, but they got rid of it. The, the, their logo is an EE because you can't <laughs> just have Inuit caricatures as the logo. That would be a problem. They still have the EE. They had a polar bear. If they were the Edmonton Polar Bears, I think completely different story. I think they'd be pretty damn cool. Nanook is a cool mascot. I, I do miss seeing that guy at the stadium. But the Elks brand just lends itself to so many other cool opportunities that you can use. Spike the mascot is pretty darn cool. The logo is awesome. The indigenous logo is awesome. Over 36,000 people were at the Elks' first home game. And if they won more than three of their last 35 home games, they probably could be at that number. And this is not a conversation. So let's talk about the numbers. They did their own study in the North where the data says that 78% of people in the Western Arctic oppose changing the name from the Eskimos to the Elks. But then you go to the Central Arctic, 55% uh, oppose the name change or key, or the name itself, sorry. And then 31% in the Eastern Arctic oppose the name. Here's the thing though, population increases from West to East. So it ends up being about 50-50 when you do the math. If 50% of a population that you're named after is not thrilled with having a football team named after them, why is that a problem? <laughs> I don't get it. Like, doesn't that just make you a little bit of a jerk not to care what they think or feel? If you really wanted to honor them, like you think the name does, respect them. This is, I, I'm so frustrated. And everybody wants to make it political, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's keep it well, in Alberta. Uh, Jason Kenney, <laughs> the former UCP leader, I'm really uncomfortable talking politics now. <laughs> he had the majority of the party on his side in the leadership review. He quit. <laughs> Ed Stelmack had 75% of them on his team. They got rid of them. So even if it's 20% of the population that's not okay with the name, that's 20% too much. 
team names are stupid in general, but to hang on to this, I don't get it. It'll bring you back to your childhood. I get it. Seeing Warren Moon sling touchdowns, I understand that. But a lot of us in Canada and Alberta have experienced loss lately. And I I don't want to bring this up, but I have romantic images of Jasper National Park as a child. And now that's gone. (laughs) You know, sometimes we have to let things go from our childhood and uh, yeah i don't know this is <laughs> this is silly well, it's, and, it's but, silly it's silly but the 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 biggest part of it that is silly is 90 percent of the people who bitch about the name change aren't indigenous they aren't inuit it's not our it's not for us to actually debate <laughs> but we're the ones who have to debate it right and and so it's just at the end of the day, they made a decision to change the name because it was offensive. It doesn't matter if you, me, Larry down the street, anybody else feels that it's not offensive. If somebody who is Inuit and they think it's offensive, it shouldn't be a name. And it's like you said, it's dumb. There's, there's, tragedies in our world that happens that are way more important than the name but we have people going onto social media saying that they don't go to a, a, an elk they they cancel their season ticket holder because or their tickets because of a name of a team i get it but if the saskatchewan rough riders changed their name to the saskatchewan tinkerbells tomorrow and had pink uniforms you know what i'm doing i'm going to buy a tinkerbell jersey because i'm a tinkerbell fan then Hey, Bret Hart wore pink, man. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with pink. But what I'm saying is the team didn't change. Yeah. What you can call the team changed. And if you want to still call them that other name in and in, in your then go ahead, but it it should be a problem if you think that you need to call something a name that is a, a slur just to make yourself feel better. It's... But if that's what you need to do, do it. But hopefully, and what I would like to see happen, but they're not very good at it, the CFL should just come out and say, we will not approve the Edmonton football team renaming them the Eskimos. That's all they need to say. Well, hey, and then and it can Dave be over. Naylor made a, an appearance. Uh, he was on a show and he said the, the league's not going to stand in the way. <laughs> I, I think the, the league's at a point where... Uh, eh, they just want somebody with deep pockets, and if they get to play with their multi-million dollar toy and fund this team into the future, um, that, yeah, they're probably going to get it. And there probably is going to be a Grey Cup in Edmonton, uh, maybe after Winnipeg, as a part of this deal. What will the name be? <laughs> Which I'm okay with, to be honest. <laughs> Here, Here's a question, though. If you're Trey Ford... <laughs> You want to stick around this damn circus? <laughs> Here's another question for you. Is if if the CFL lets them go back to the name is what's what's diversity and and strength and all that crap about? That's what I want to say. Sorry. Well, the, the same back. people that are uh, wanting the old name back say that that whole campaign was crap from the start so I don't think they care I, I, I think changing the name back would be for short short term game uh, I, I, I do think I really do think they will sell uh, a few more tickets early on uh, if they change the name back but if the team continues to suck they're, they're going to forget about what it's called either way uh, either way unfortunate that this conversation is still happening <laughs> um, but it is and uh, it's a possibility uh, and all eyes are going to be on that press conference in Edmonton as uh, Larry Thompson gets introduced uh, Sir. to the public we'll start with Thursday Night Football where the Calgary Stampeders are three and a half point favorites over the Ottawa Red Blacks the over under at 49 and a half now Sheldon this is also really unfortunate because 
um, the return of Jeremiah Masoli is really understated. And I don't know how much success he's going to have under center for Ottawa, but I do know that his perseverance and his desire to be on a football field is actually really inspiring. And I'm a fan of Jeremiah Masoli, and man, he dealt with so much crap. Dane Evans took over for him in Hamilton, and Dane Evans is gone. <laughs> and, and, and Jeremiah is still here. Now, he played four games for the Red Blacks in 2022. We all know what happened, the Garrett Marino uh, incident, and suffered a serious injury. And then, Jeremiah Masoli made a start July 8th, 2023, uh, in the first half, non-contact injury, out for the year and he's finally back on the football field at 35 years old this is a story i really wish him the best i wish him all the success in the world and i'm happy and i hope that he does get to end his cfl career on his terms i completely agree uh i I kind of think of Jeremiah Masoli the exact same way that I kind of thought of Caleros when uh, he was traded from the Riders to Toronto. Uh, I really wanted to see him succeed, but I just really didn't know if he could escape this injury bug and if he if he was just you know too injury prone or, or what have you. And I, and you get to the point where you're like, man, I just want this guy to be able to have a life and to not have to be dealing with pain the rest of his life. I know Zach was a little bit different with it being head trauma, but, you know, <laughs> leg trauma is not good. And you don't want somebody to be, you know, walking with a limp at 40 years old from football, right? But uh, we have seen with what happened with Zach Caleros after that, and he was able to regain form and even get, better than I think anyone thought he could. So I'm hopeful that the same thing can happen for Jeremiah Masoli because like you, I am a fan of him. I think he's exciting. I think I kind of think of him in the same way that I used to think of Vernon Adams where like just an exciting guy who, you know, wants to he puts everything out there and he's going to he's going to literally give his body to make the play. And uh, so it's a tough task for him to come in and, and play in in a stadium where Calgary is only able to win in, and they they they're really good in that stadium for some reason. And without having Pimpleton there, that's uh that's gonna be a, a a tough task. But he's been healthy. He's been getting those practice reps. Uh, obviously, they think that he's better to go in there than Dustin Crum. Uh, but I, I just, I hope the best. And But I'm going to be watching this game and every time he gets hit, being like, get up. <laughs> and, yeah, and it sucks yeah. that that's how it is, but that's how it's going to be. Yeah, and I, the strength of the Red Blacks right now is uh, their defense. They've only actually given up two touchdowns in their past uh, three games. And Calgary is going to be tested on the offensive line as Sean McEwen is on the injured list for one game. And Trevon Tate, a veteran offensive lineman, has started four games for the Stampeders. Started at right tackle last game against Toronto for the Stampeders. Has been released. So Joshua Coker is going to start at right tackle. Rodim Brown is going to start at center for the Stamps, 24 years old. And uh, the center on the O-line is the quarterback of uh, the O-line, really. So that's going to be a test for him and the entire offensive line with a couple veterans uh, not being there compared to last week. And we do know <laughs> that the Red Blacks' D-line, they're fierce. And that's going to be a massive test for anybody behind that offensive line. You know, Peyton Logan and Jake Mayer. Yeah, uh, like he, we say it every time, or I say it every time, if they can get the ball out quick and if they can get short passes, then, then Calgary's going to have success. Uh, I think that, I think Logan, he's a dynamic back and plus if he's in the return game too he can be a very good uh, pick in fantasy with getting all those yards and stuff so uh i don't know like i i think that 
I think how like you just have to take how Calgary plays at home into account here because that's what they've shown. So I think a lot of people are expecting Calgary to win here, which I don't think that would be the case if it wasn't in Calgary, which is it's, it's so bizarre. This year is just <laughs> so bizarre. But I, I I just hope it's a good game. I hope that it Jaron Wild doesn't get injured. I, I hope I hope it's just an exciting Thursday night football game. If you have one running back on the roster, I mean, they've actually talked about, and this is for the Stamps, like maybe Tony, Tommy Stevens, like if something happens to Peyton Logan, or Jalen Philpott could carry the football. But if you have one guy on the roster, are you trying to limit the hits he's taking? Like, you got to manage that somehow, right? Do they not have a running back on the practice roster? Like, well, I don't understand. Or did they? Is, BJ is, like, Emmons they... got hurt, and Dedrick yeah. Mills has stepped away from the team yeah. for personal reasons. Right, and they're yeah. trying to uh, get. I think his name is Hill, Kylan Hill, uh, up to speed here. And there's Ron Tia Vasu, or uh, I'll learn that name. I promise. Good work. But a lot of, for all the depth that they had at the beginning of the year, uh, okay. that, that seems to have kind of melted away. I tell you this, though. If I saw Tommy Stevens lining up as running back, <laughs> oh, that would be pretty... That'd be wild. Pretty, pretty wild, yeah. yeah. I, he'd be just a huge running back, and, you know, we've seen what he can do when he's only got one yard or one or, or under center not even in the shotgun and having a little bit of a run there so hey maybe maybe that's what dave's gonna do and call some wildcat call some tommy stevens in there that would be pretty cool actually now ottawa and calgary both have like similar splits in the way where ottawa's one and two on the road ottawa's four oh and one at home calgary's four and oh at home and 0-5 on the road. <laughs> so that's why the I think the betting lines favor Calgary. Yeah. And I, I don't know. Like do you take the ride on Jake Mayer. He seems to be playing well at McMahon Stadium, and <laughs> maybe that continues this week. Maybe. Uh if if I pick him, it would certainly wouldn't. So <laughs> maybe I should. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, he plays well at home. I, I don't know. I don't know why they all do. Maybe they need to start treating their home games like road games to try to figure out how they can win on the road, stay in a hotel the night before. I don't know. But because uh, if you can only win at home and not win on the road, you're nine and nine. And what's that going to get you right now? Not much. Nine and nine, it'd be pretty decent in the West. It looks like it right now. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Well, Winnipeg's going to surge. BC's going to win every game the rest of the season because Rourke's back. Come on. <laughs> well, let's go to Regina here, where uh, the the Riders are one and a half point underdogs. Uh, the, the visiting Montreal Alouettes, where the over under is at fifty point five. Now, do you see the Owls and Jason Moss kind of playing some games, hiding the status of Cody Fajardo a little bit? Now, Fajardo was listed as available last week, but Davis Alexander got the start. He's listed as available this week, practiced in full on Wednesday. We don't know if he's starting uh, back in his own old stomping grounds yet. Now, Davis Alexander, uh, he had some personal things to deal with on Tuesday, but re returned to the team on Wednesday. Uh, I don't know who's going to start for the Alouettes. Jason Moss hasn't ruled out Cody Fajardo yet. Could he return under center for the Owls? Well, he certainly could. Uh, I, Corey Mace is doing the exact same thing here too, so uh, I think true. they're just ga they're just gaming each other. But the interesting thing that I think I read, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but the day that Davis missed practice, Cody was there, but he wasn't taking any first string That's reps. That's true. So uh, you would think if Cody is going to be playing, that when Davis wasn't there, he would have been taking the first string. Uh, reps there, so I, I I don't think we're gonna see Cody here. Um, 
which again, it'll be now, it'll be four games that he'll be out with not being on the six game injured list, but uh, stranger things have happened. And maybe if something happens and Davis isn't doing well, or if he gets injured, then maybe you will see Cody because I don't know if they're going to just throw Dominique Davis (laughs) to the wolves right away here, but Hey, actually, they're playing the Riders. That would probably be a smart thing to do. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I definitely think it's gamesmanship. But like I said, the Riders are doing it too. So fair game. You're just making you're making the the defensive coordinators do a little extra work this week. That's all you're doing. Now, Tyson Philpot is out for this game for the Alouettes. Um, they're already without receivers Tyler Sneed and Kayon Julian Grant. I think. Most teams in the CFL, if they were to lose receivers of that caliber, they'd be really struggling. The Alouettes are 8-1, a pretty sizable lead in the East Division, and just losing another one in Tyson Philpot. So they do have a little bit of a cushion uh, in that way. Um, If he needs a game off, have a game off. Same with uh, Cody Fajardo. Um but this is really interesting. We've seen Charleston Rambo sort of emerge as a significant target in that Alouette's offense. But their rookie, I guess, sensation last year, rookie of the year, Austin Mack, went to the Atlanta Falcons, where Nathan Rourke most recently was in the NFL. He has been released. He's going to try to get with another NFL team, but the Alouettes left space in their salary cap for the possibility of Austin Mack returning to the team at this point in the season. If Mack comes back, they've got Rambo at full speed. Hopefully Philpot gets back sooner rather than later, and Fajardo gets back. Ugh. This Alouette team, I, I, I still don't know if they're getting the respect that they deserve at this point in the season. And I think we talked about it at the beginning of the year. The reigning Grey Cup champs, but Jason Moss has found a way for these guys to still at least feel like underdogs, just like last year. And I think that's an important way to keep the fire burning. Uh, that nobody believes in you. You have the chip on your shoulder. But if they get Mac back, even if it's not for another month, six weeks or something like that, this team is going to be formidable down the stretch, man. Yeah. Uh, I think I think there may be some fans that don't give them the credit they deserve, but I think as on a whole when it comes to podcasts and and analysts and power rankings and stuff like that i think montreal has been number one you know ever since the beginning of the year so i think i think they're getting the respect that they need to there but but yeah i do think that jason is playing up the the underdog role and, and i think he's the perfect coach to do that uh he's they had a very very poignant us against them mentality uh, going into the Grey Cup last year with Cody's uh, excellent rant and or whatever you want to call it with the F you just watch. Uh, and, and that's the mentality that they're keeping going. So uh, it's worked so far. And, and, and there's been between them, the riders, even you could say the Argos, there's been a lot of teams that have been able to get some wins still with have, not having their starting quarterback. And so that's been pretty impressive this season. I think that's added to the dynamic of just how crazy the season is because of the amount of injuries and suspensions, I guess, that were in the beginning of the season. And But now it seems like all the teams are getting healthy near the halfway point or just after the halfway point. And so hopefully players can stay healthy and and down the stretch we just have some amazing football for the riders trevor harris has completed his six game injured list stint they haven't officially called him the starter but he's taken the starter reps uh in practice and practice doesn't lie it also does look like aj oled is going to make his return to the riders backfield as well 
I do like what Frankie Hickson brings to the table. Sometimes it feels like they don't trust him as much as I feel they should. They should mm-hmm. be giving him a bigger role in the offense as I think he can handle it. Um, but they do have that trust in A.J. Olette. And they uh, proved that earlier this year with the amount of carries that they were giving him. Maybe not the yardage production yet, But as the carries add up and the weather cools down after Labor Day, that's only going to get more and more important to your offense. It does appear like another change at offensive line for the Riders with Logan Furlan kind of swapping spots with Nick Jones, I believe. Uh, Logan Furlan possibly starting at right tackle. Good for him. Hey, the Canadian taking that important role on a O-line, and he's certainly made strides as an offensive lineman with the Rough Riders, but doesn't that make it five different starting right tackles this season for the Riders? That's not in- insignificant. No, for sure. It's it's not a great thing, but I think... I think moving Fairland out to the to the outside is the smartest move that Mace can do right now because you now have Jones in between two veterans instead of having Jones on the outside. So you have you have that communication, and that's exactly what Corey Mace said in his press conference today. Like you, you're able to have that communication and help him learn, but at the same time. If 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 they see a matchup where they need to bring Logan back inside and have Jones go outside, they're fully comfortable doing that too. Uh, so it's good to have some uh, some flexibility, I guess. There, Corey Mace did say that following the following week when Toronto or when the Riders come back from Toronto, that Philip Blake will be joining them coming back, and so his rehab is going well apparently. So. That's good news for the riders too. Um, they did, haven't released a depth chart yet for tomorrow. I was just looking to see if they had. Uh, so I, I just really hope that they do have Hicks and Ann AJ on there uh, because I think even like <laughs> dare to dream, but like imagine having a, a set with Trevor Harris under center, AJ Oled is the fullback, and Frankie Hickson is a tailback, and just seeing what you could run out of there. That'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> like, it'd be amazing. That's your short yardage group right there. But at the same time, you could, you could, you could fake it to Hicks and have have AJ go out. Like, you, I honestly think that just with their body types, that's like that's the old school NFL power fullback and tailback combination, right? That I know I played the hell out of in Madden back in the day. I would always use my fullback. Hey, there uh, was so an old like, uh, fullback, very famous in Regina, that used to wear the number thirty four that. Uh, tore the CFL apart for many, many years. So, hey, going back to that old school formation would be pretty cool. Uh, You know, I I always push for teams to run the ball more and get that part of their game going, but it's also run the ball creatively. And at this point, that would be running the ball creatively because we haven't seen teams do that for quite some time. Yeah, Uh, and and I think we saw that Hickson was a little bit different than AJ, but even when AJ got hurt, I was talking with some fan or some people on on the internet or on Rider fans, I think, because people were saying that AJ should be cut and they should keep Hickson. When when AJ got hurt, yeah, he may not have been getting a crazy amount of yards, but he was third in the league when that happened. Because in general, at the beginning of the season, the the running backs were having a tough time. In the last few weeks, with Javon Leak and with Frankie Hickson and and with even Standback in the first half, uh, like I think they the the running game has improved significantly. Uh, so it's it's good to see, and I hope that continues because once we get to the playoff time, that's that hard nosed football is is. I know as a former lineman, that's <laughs> that's my favorite part is just seeing teams grind out the ball. I want to see who the Riders are going to be lining up at receiver. No, Adjo Adjo didn't play last week, but he's already listed as out. He's got the 
the finger issue. Keyshawn Johnson is listed as available, but Dante Myers, I think, last week earned a stay on the roster having a 100-yard game. But uh, will Trevor Harris be looking his way? That kind of changes how uh, things are going to look. He seemed, at least early in the season, to really go to Sean Bain Jr. and really um, trust what number 15 brings to the table. And he's been extremely underrated. I think across the league this year he seems to be a reliable guy a lot of his stuff happens after the catch and maybe that's why um, people don't think about him as much but yeah he is awesome after the catch and the riders would be well suited to get the ball into his hands Jameer Thurman back for the defense at middle linebacker and that's good because cj avery filled in for him and now he's out with uh, the head injury and hasn't practiced this year so thurman being back on the defense is big for the green and white as well oh for sure and like with i'd say with him and micah johnson those are probably the two big leaders on d so having him out there he's able to help quarterback that defense and and just his intensity uh it seems like he was able to heal up either really quickly or he's able to deal with the pain really quickly. I don't know what what it is here, but uh, as long as there's no risk to re-injure or make it worse, then hopefully that's what the team has seen with them initially having him on the sixth game and taking him off after one game. Um, but it, it just you can't understate the value that he has on the, on the, the field. Uh, so it, it's very exciting as a Ryder fan to have him back. The Edmonton Elks go to Hamilton on Saturday and the Elks are two and a half point favorites. The over under at 52 and a half as the Elks are riding high, uh, coming off two consecutive wins. So why wouldn't they be uh, uh, confident right now i do want to mention something out of hamilton that i guess not exactly football related but a radio station that launched in 1927 900 chml has closed um wednesday the the station going off the air and for a long long time fans in hamilton listening to the fifth quarter rick zamperin was still a host there and now the station's closed. There is, of course, the Tie Cats audio network. Um, the game's still going to be on Y108 FM. Um, and hopefully Zamperin can be brought into the fold by the Tie Cats because he's certainly a skilled broadcaster and brings a lot to the table uh, for coverage of Hamilton football. It's a sad day for the media landscape in Hamilton, Ontario. Um, but starting. His first game of 2024 is Taylor Powell. And those reps that he got last year for the Ticats, we're going to see if he's going to take that next step. And I know the coaches obviously are high on him, taking the ball out of Bo Levi Mitchell's hands and going with the younger option. Maybe, and this is just deja vu for uh, Bo Levi Mitchell, who something similar happened to him in Calgary with Jake Mayer uh, getting the job and getting the reins of uh, the Stampeders offense. But I, I think Taylor Powell is coming in here pretty underrated and pretty overlooked. They're two and seven. They've got really nothing to lose. But I'm expecting him to have a nice start on Saturday. Yeah, uh, well, hopefully for for them because it seems like they're willing. They, I don't know if they recognize that, or if they think that Bo was the problem, or if they're just trying to do shake up, or if it's just all along Milanovic wanted Powell to be his guy, but he kind of didn't want to deal with cutting Bo Levi. I don't know, um, but it, it certainly. As an outsider, it certainly feels weird to have just everything be put on Bo here. But um, I think Taylor Powell looked really good in, in when he was in there last year. I think he is a bright future. I love seeing these younger quarterbacks like Drew Brown and him. Uh, even seeing some progress from Shea Patterson. Uh, 
especially and then now with Nathan Rourke back in here like it's good to have a good young core of 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 quarterbacks who are able to play at a high level while also having you know a core of veterans that can be those perennial uh you know top five top 10 tsn players um but i i just i I just hope that it works out because like it, it might be a little too early to give up i think but at the same time you are in technically in a rebuild. I think they they wanted to do a retool instead of a rebuild with with Milanovic there. But it, obviously, if you're you're moving on from from Bo here, you're you're giving the reins to the young guy. You're you're trying out some other players. So I think they're just auditioning for next year already. But it just seems early to do that. At the same time, I, I don't I don't know. I thought Hamilton is going to be a lot different this year. Uh, so it's it's hard to see this happening. I, I especially at when I know they weren't winning at the first, but Bo was playing really well, and it just seemed like their defense was kind of letting them down. And I, I just don't see the changes on the defense that would make me think that switching a quarterback is going to do anything different. I think I did pick Hamilton last uh, in my preseason uh, predictions, so let that be known. <laughs> For the record, but hey, last week they ran into some O line uh, health problems. Joel Figueroa yeah. getting hurt in the game. He hasn't practiced uh, this week, but it does look like Brendan Bordner uh, probably going to be in line to start at left tackle for the Thai Cats. And it does appear that Jamal Peters and Stavros Cats and Tonis have been practicing. Scott Milanovic saying that uh, he's hopeful they'll be healthy enough to play this weekend. Having uh, Cats and Tonis and Peters on the field is essential for the defense in Tiger Town. Eyes are also on another quarterback, and that is Trey Ford of the Edmonton Elks. He's dealing with a rib issue. Uh, G. Roy says his spirits are good. He's going to try to be on the field for Saturday, but practice doesn't lie. McLeod Bethel Thompson took first team reps for the Edmonton Elks on Wednesday. Um, at, at this point, it kind of seems like it's probably be better for Trey to get 100% healthy rather than going out there at 75% or whatever he is, right? And with his mobility and his elusiveness and, and just him running around, you never know when there's going to be that random, you know, <laughs> wrong place at the wrong time kind of hit that could make it worse. So I think... I think playing with caution is right here. Like they're the, they're in the same kind of position as Hamilton, although they're just kind of on the uptick with winning two in a row. Like they're still you know only won two games. So I think they need to do what's smart for their league. They're going to have or for their team. I mean, it's going to be a it's going to be a probably tough for them to keep their focus with the news of the new ownership and all this media stuff about the team so like Jarius Jackson's got to find a way to keep them grounded and keep them locked in on the on the game against Hamilton here uh, but McLeod Bethel Thompson looked actually pretty good coming in relief for Ford last week so hopefully uh, for Elk fans he can keep that going and uh, it's Edmonton 2.5 points I think that's probably pretty good line they have for this game but uh, it'll be it'll just be interesting to see which teams can can capitalize on the other team's mistakes and see who can put the ball in the end zone. This whole week is full of intriguing matchups. <laughs> it, it really is. And the Sunday nighter became a whole lot more intriguing when the BC Lions brought Nathan Rourke back into the fold. The Lions were kind of limping into this game. Uh, three consecutive losses, including being shut out by the Winnipeg Blue Bombers before the Bombers went on the bye. Now the Bombers returned from the bye and another star is returning to the lineup in Kenny the King Lawler, who broke his arm in week one of the season. Ontario Wilson gets onto the roster for the Bombers, and three of his last four games have been 100-yard efforts. 
Now they're both going to be on the roster for the Bombers. It did feel like maybe that veteran group held it together and things were going to start surging back up for the team that's been in the last four Grey Cups representing the West. But now, (laughs) everything has changed, hasn't it, Sheldon? With Nathan Rourke being back at practice for the Lions, you said he looked good. Um, As uh, in practice, I've read the reports as well. The upper deck last week was already open at BC Place. And you have to assume number 12 being back will sell more tickets. And like we've seen In other instances this year, like Trey Ford and Edmonton, you have to assume Rourke would bring a whole lot more confidence and swagger to that BC Lions team. Well, you would think, but you also have we have to we have to temper our expectations here a little bit because this guy hasn't played meaningful football in two and a half years. So uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see how quickly, if there's any rust, he can shake it off. Uh, like you said, he went three of thirteen in his preseason action in the NFL. He had a really good run, though. He had a couple drops too. So uh, I think not all of it was on him, but he's that's with players he doesn't have a a chemistry with and coaches that he doesn't have a chemistry with, which he does have here. And, and, you know, at least for their sake, it's the late game in the week and they have this little, like a little bit extra time for practice. Um, And, and to be honest, like it's, it's going to be tough for Winnipeg to have to dig deep or dig back and get those Nathan Rourke uh, film. And cause they, I'm sure the coaches had no, Last week, they probably weren't thinking they were going to have to game plan for Nathan Rourke. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see which which team can uh, can ga- can game plan properly for the other, I guess. We also thought that BC coming off the bye and going to Winnipeg on a short week was going to be in BC's favor, and they got shut out. So uh, I think it's, it's a little bit of a different circumstance, but... Uh, I just think it's 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 different just because of the fact that they have to game plan for Nathan Rourke now. They have to. They knew that that Vernon Adams was hurt. They knew that he, they probably weren't going to be playing him, but they probably thought they were playing Jake Dolagala. So they were probably installing a plan where they have to deal with this pocket passer who just got as a cannon of the arm, and you know if you confuse him, he's probably going to throw the ball wrong. But now they have to go back to pretty much a hybrid of a guy who can run around the field like crazy, but can also just sling it and throw for 400 yards easily. So uh, I think it's a tough task for, for Winnipeg. They, they aren't the same team that went into to BC and did that. Zach doesn't have the same protection. He's a couple years older, a couple, you know, seconds, maybe slower in the pocket. Uh, getting Kenny, the King back is, is definitely good. Um, and BC has been susceptible to some bigger plays on on offense too. So, I think I think this has the has the potential to be game of the week. It has potential to be a shootout. It, but it also has potential to be a stinker because uh, Rourke's not figuring it out, and Winnipeg hasn't shown that they can consistently perform on offense either. So, uh, it's it's a very interesting dynamic for this game. BC uh, giving up the second most yards of net offense a game. Edmonton the most, 377 yards a game. BC, 371, only six yards back. And I'll say this about the Bombers. I think a lot of the... uh, Obviously, the offense has struggled to start the year. But I think some people thought, "Uh, the defense isn't the same either. Well, after their shutout over the Lions... It's changed a lot, and Vernon Adams Jr. was playing MOP-level football. Calgary found a way to shut him down, and I think Winnipeg really just copied that game plan. Now, things are different now that uh, Rourke is in the fold here, but Winnipeg is the first uh, in points allowed, 20.7. They're giving up the least yards a game now, 320.8. The least passing yards a game, 226 
But they're giving up the most rush yards a game, 108.7 yards. Now, I don't think we need to worry about that with BC. They've proven time and time again they're not too worried about committing to the run, even with William Stanback. So maybe that is a moot point. But over the last few weeks, it seems like the Bombers have been able to pressure the quarterback again and make it a problem for opposing quarterbacks. You know that they're going to have their ears pinned back. And the offensive line at times this season has struggled in protection. Rourke can get the ball away quickly. He is mobile. We 100% know that. But if he's going to be dropping back 40 times to throw the ball, uh, I think the Bombers might be ready for that. Yep, that's Those are all fair points. Man, you make me feel good. (laughs) (laughs) When when you say stuff like that that I just can't refute, then that makes my job easy, I guess. Hey, the Bombers, they have some decisions to make as well um, with Kenny the King getting healthy. Um, Is Lucky Whitehead going to stay on the roster? Uh, It it appears that they're going to have to do some shuffling, and he might be returning kicks. Um for the Bombers in this one will be really interesting to see Lucky returning to a a place where he had so many good performances and so many games uh, in Vancouver. This is an intriguing week. I didn't ask you at the beginning of the show, um, but where do you think Vernon Adams Jr. ends up (laughs) after all this? Well... I honestly don't know. Like, it's going to be crazy because unless Bo is ready to retire, he's going to be available. If so, Rourke, I mean, not Rourke. So Vernon Adams and Bo will both be available, it looks like. Uh, we don't know what the riders are going to do with Trevor Harris. He's getting, he's going to be 39, I think. So that's, that's up there. Zach is getting older. So uh, I, I, I believe it's Calgary, Edmonton, Sask. They don't have a starting quarterback on contract after yeah, <laughs> this year. Yeah. But Vernon Adams, like BC's not going to want to give him away for nothing to a West team. Well, right? but, but that's the thing, though. BC has zero leverage here because they have guaranteed money on the books. So the teams can be like, you know what? You you screwed up and we're not going to trade for you and you're going to have to cut him and then have that guaranteed money on the books. Uh, so I think <laughs> that's going to be wild. <laughs> and then you have Trey Ford. You, like, is Trey Ford willing to stick around? Is he? Does he feel slighted these past couple of years? Like, does he feel like he can trust that he's going to be given a fair shot after because well, there could he... possibly be a new coaching regime in Edmonton well, they're as inter- well. So yeah. yeah, this guy might have, this guy might want to bring Chris Jones. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, like there, who knows who this guy wants to have yeah. coach? Who knows if who he wants to be GM? Like, if he wants to be the smartest guy in the room, I, there was a guy who said he'd be open to doing some consulting just a couple weeks ago. Wally Buono. Get that guy on your team. Get that guy in the consulting. Help him. Like, that's... I just did your job for you, Larry. But didn't Wally consult on the uh, um, the whole Chris Jones thing? I'm pretty sure he was involved in that. Yeah, I, can't, uh, I think. Uh, um, yeah, you can't bat a hundred or you can't bat a thousand. <laughs> there are crazy times <laughs> going forward. I'm just saying that the Rourke and the Edmonton news now overshadows the command center talk. So the league's like, thank you. Thank you for taking the heat off of us. And the Argos are saying, thank you. Thank you. Quietly reinstate Chad Kelly and we'll all forget about all this. This might be the craziest, I don't know, craziest August in CFL history. In the league. Cricket, 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 (laughs) cricket. This is a wild, wild season, and I'm so glad that we get to talk about it a couple hours every single week. Um, I'm going to load up my fantasy lineup here. 
Now, I, I did roll the numbers, Sheldon. Over the past three weeks, my quarterbacks got a combined 11 points. So, yeah, there was a YouTube comment saying, I want to go the exact opposite direction uh, that the, these two go with my fantasy lineup. That is certainly a fair uh, and just Smart. strategy. <laughs> So hard. <laughs> my quarterback's Jake Mayer. I I don't know. I I, I want to hitch my wagon to McMahon Stadium, Jake. <laughs> Let's see what he's going to do. Hopefully, uh, quick six will go for a few runs down the sideline at McMahon at the hands of Jake Mayer. My running backs are James Butler and Brady Oliveira. I, again, they're expensive, but I'm just confident in the usage and the carries that both guys will get. I paired up Reggie Bagleton with Jake Mayer. I took Charleston Rambo, which I don't know what this guy needs to do to have a salary above... Tw- He's 2500 I know. He was the leading nuts. receiver last week, 30.4 points. I, I yeah. don't understand this algorithm. And hey, I was looking for Nathan Rourke at last check. He wasn't on there yet. <laughs> No, he was not. <laughs> Tim White is in my flex, and I actually took the Calgary defense. I got $1,800 left over. Uh, Sheldon, what's your lineup looking like? Well, I tell you, it was it's nice now that I, I apparently didn't save it, so I quickly did Ooh. it again while I was talking with you. So, But I still got it. Okay, so I'm going with the, the Calgary Stampeders defense. Because they are the cheapest defense. That's the only reason. Uh, Zach Caleros will be my quarterback. Uh, running backs, I have Javon Leak and Peyton Logan. Uh, my receivers, I have Reggie Bagleton, Justin McInnes, and Alexander Hollins. Now, Hollins hasn't practiced on Wednesday due to a knee issue. Shoot. But that's then I right might not now. have him. That's right now. This is this. Okay, here's the deal. The reason why I picked Hollins, just to be completely honest with you, is because when I go to have when I go to pick my last player, I still have sixteen thousand dollars left oh. over. Yeah. <laughs> like when I I can't remember the exact apparently, but when I had my team set before, I had six point nine thousand left. <laughs> Nice. I, I sent you that screenshot, but now I can't remember exactly which players it was. But um, yeah, I think I think it's going to be an interesting, interesting week that none of us are going to be right. No one's like this is the the strangest week this year so far. I think to call. Yeah, and it's nice to have that happening at week 11 of the CFL season. It starts on Thursday. The Calgary Stampeders, three and a half point favorites over the visiting Ottawa Red Blacks. I'm taking Calgary in that one. Where are you going, Sheldon? Yeah, I'm taking Calgary as well. Uh, but I'm not certain that that's going to happen. But that that's where my, my head is going. The Riders are hosting the Montreal Alouettes, and the Riders are one-and-a-half-point underdogs here. I'm taking Sask. If Cody and Philpot were playing for the Owls, I'd probably go Montreal here. But I, I think I'm going Riders. Yeah, I'm also taking Sask. So Hamilton home to the Edmonton Elks. The Elks are two-and-a-half-point favorites. Oh, I'm going tie cats, Sheldon. Mm, I'm going Elks. And finally, the BC Lions, home to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, where the Bombers are one and a half point favorites. I was Bombers all in. But Bola Combo, Ben Halatic. On the on the field for the Lions, Nathan Rourke on the field for the Lions, Kenny the King on the field for the Bombers. Who boy, I I'm going <laughs> going BC, I guess. Like uh, w- w- this is we're gonna see. I think here what we're gonna be getting from the Bombers the rest of the year. I think this is going to help them. 
decide or us decide if they're going to fight back to a playoff spot kind of thing. Who I'm taking BC though. Where are you going? I am also taking BC, but I am not confident. <laughs> I I'm not com- I'm only confident. I think in the Riders. I think I am confident in the Riders winning, but no other game am I actually confident in. The- I can't in believe I'm game. saying this. I think I'm only confident in Calgary winning. <laughs> Hey, yeah, but Mazzoli think, could be uh, his old MOP self, too. Could you imagine? That's, well, that's like, I want to see that. I yeah. want that Cinderella story. I want to see, I want to see Mazzoli go off. I want to see Rourke go off. I, I want to see like Calgary lose. That'd be great. That's, <laughs> Poor Dan. Calgary could lose and Winnipeg could lose and the Riders could win. Man, that'd be a great week. Week 11 in the CFL season is upon us. You can rate, review, and subscribe to To and Out on your favorite podcatcher. Uh, make sure you subscribe, ring the bell. Hey, leave a comment, good or bad, on YouTube as well. You can support <laughs> the show on Patreon. And hey, check out the website, toandout.ca. You can buy To and Out merch there too. I'm Travis Curra. He is Sheldon Jones. Please enjoy the football. Please stay safe. And we will recap it all next week. Thanks for listening. Find more great shows like this at CF Pod Network on Twitter. 